Hey, it's Mark Robidoux. Welcome to this IFR Mastery Challenge. In today's scenario, our pilot is preparing to fly an RNAV approach with the help of a TAA on the chart. This should be about as simple as it gets, but for some reason, the more they study the chart, the more confused they get. And now they're not sure how they should fly this seemingly simple approach. Take this challenge and see if you can figure it out. Let's jump into this scenario now. You own a Piper Seminole based in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Today you'll fly to Tillamook, Oregon for reasons that have nothing to do with cheese. To stay below the potential icing and oxygen requirements, you decide to stay on the airways. You've also never been to Tillamook, so you review the only approach, the RNAV Runway 13. It's a pretty standard T-shaped RNAV approach with the IAF at Fetage right on Victor 27. South winds along the coast with ceilings ranging from 1,000 to 1,500 feet should make it an uneventful approach with a straight in landing. Your route comes back as filed with the expected departure from Coeur d'Alene. Coeur d'Alene 2, Carps, Victor 120, Spokane, Tango 268, Murph, Tango 317, Astoria, Victor 27, Fetage, Direct. You depart, climb above the clouds, and head west. Two hours later, you're about 45 miles from Tillamook, one mile from the Astoria VOR. Seattle Center has you a little high at 8,000 feet, so you ask for lower. The controller replies with, how about this? Report IFR cancellation on the ground or this frequency. Cleared RNAV runway 13 approach Tillamook. You read back the clearance in all its brevity. It must be a quiet day, and it seems odd that the controller didn't issue an altitude. But then again, the approach has a TAA. As you turn over Astoria, your Garmin 530W shows 32 miles to Fetage, so you'll be inside that TAA within a minute. Your course to Fetage is 170 degrees, which puts you in the northeast quadrant with a 5,500 foot altitude. The moment the distance remaining hits 30 miles, you start down and get the one minute weather at Tillamook. It's now overcast 800, just 70 feet above minimums, so this approach just got more serious. Briefing the chart, you're surprised to notice that this quadrant doesn't say no PT. It seems like a waste of time and fuel to fly the hold in lieu of procedure turn, not to mention you've been in the air for just over two hours and are ready to get on the ground. Some quick mental math says turning straight in from 5,500 feet and getting down to 2,800 at INSAG would be about 465 feet per mile, or almost 1,000 feet per minute at the 120 knots you use for intermediate segments. And that doesn't include slowing down to 110 knots for final approach. You'd rather not cross INSAG high or fast given you want to get down early enough to spot the runway and land. This must be why there's a procedure turn required from this sector that would get you down to 4,500. The airway you're still on has an MEA of 5,000, so surely that's a safe altitude. If you could get down to 5,000 by fetage, a straight-in approach would be manageable. The headwind component of 10 to 20 knots all the way down will help too. ATC probably wouldn't care if you shaved off those extra 500 feet. Alternatively, you could request direct JECWEF. That direct route would be inside the 5,500 foot sector, and then you'd descend to 4,500 while flying JECWEF to Fetage. Actually, you were just cleared RNAV runway 13 approach. You should be able to use any IAF you want, right? Then again, if you could just deviate 20 degrees right, you'd be in that other arrival sector before reaching Fetage, and you could continue descending to 4,500 with no procedure turn. Or you could just accept the hold in lieu of procedure turn to lose the altitude, but not fly the whole five miles out and back. That still seems like an unnecessary and unwanted waste of time. What will you do? 1. Descend to the Victor 27 MEA of 5000 and request straight in to remove the hold in lieu of procedure turn. 2. Request direct JECWEF, cross it at 5500, and use the next segment to descend to cross Fetage at 4500. 3. Request to deviate 20 degrees right. Once inside the other sector, request approach clearance and descend to 4500 for a straight in from Fetage. 4. Descend to 5500 and fly an abbreviated hold in lieu of procedure turn to descend to cross Fetage at 4500. Analyze the resources, 
and make your choice. Okay, so this scenario is a little different in that there may be several good options at work. Your challenge here is to pick the best one. Pause the video if you need more time. Now we'll hear from Catherine Cavignaro. She's a regular columnist for AOPA Pilot Magazine and was the 2020 FAA Certified Flight Instructor of the Year. Let's find out what Catherine would do. It's been an uneventful flight from Coeur d'Alene, but the lower than forecast 800 foot ceiling suggests that we shouldn't dawdle getting into Tillamook. Any of these options could work, but the clear winner for me is option one. First, let's clarify one thing. Although the RNAV runway 13 includes a terminal arrival area, it doesn't apply to us. We're on Victor 27, approaching the IAF at Fetage. When ATC cleared us for the approach without specifying an altitude, that gave us permission to descend to the lowest appropriate MEA. With IFR GPS, that's the GPS MEA of 5000 on Victor 27. ATC didn't specify a fix, so we're expected to begin the approach at Fetage, which is also on Victor 27. Arrivals on the airway lack the no PT note. So, by the book, we must fly the hold in lieu of a procedure turn at Fetage. Requesting ATC approval for the straight in removes that requirement. They probably wouldn't notice if we just omitted it, but that's the rule, so request it we will. Let's run through the other options and see why they just don't measure up. There is nothing wrong with option two of requesting direct Jekhov we would use the TAA minimum altitude of 5,500 feet. Then we could descend to 4,500 until joining the final approach course. But this option initially points us toward higher terrain and adds two 90-degree turns. It's just not worth the added maneuvering to be 500 feet lower at Fetage. To evaluate option three, start by noting that we're currently on a magnetic course of 169 degrees to Fetage. To reach the 4,500-foot TAA sector, we'd have to deviate west until the magnetic course to Fetage showed less than 158 degrees. That means a clearance to fly west off the Pacific coast in IMC for several minutes before turning direct Fetage. It's less maneuvering than with Jekov, but still not worth the effort. Option four includes descending to 5,500 presumably because that's the TAA altitude for the northeast wedge. Not only can we descend lower by virtue of the airway, 5500 will put us above the plus V guidance we're likely to get from the Garmin 530W. That won't work unless we fly some sort of course reversal. How do we know 4500 feet is unnecessary, 5000 feet is fine, and 5500 feet is too high when we won't even see the plus V guidance until crossing Fetage. That just takes a little mental math. The southerly wind will help steepen our approach, but we'll assume zero wind to account for the worst case scenario. On the intermediate segment between Fetage and INSAG, we'll descend from 5,000 to 2,800 over 5.8 nautical miles. That's 380 feet per nautical mile. To convert that to a descent rate, multiply it by the ground speed in miles per minute. That's easy if your ground speed is a multiple of 60, so we'll round up our approach speed to 120 knots for our Seminole. The required descent rate is now just double the gradient. We must descend at 760 feet per minute. I'll admit that had we started the approach at 4,500 at Fetage, we could have gotten by with a descent rate of 590 feet per minute. But 760 feet per minute is comfortable enough, which is why options 2 and 3 are unnecessary. But we're not done yet, because the real catch is the final segment from Insage to Kyukyo. This appears to require a descent rate of about 500 feet per minute, but Kyukyo is only half a mile from the end of the runway. If we arrived at Kyukyo at the MDA of 760 feet, 
and immediately slowed to 90 knots, touching down on the 1,000-foot markers would require an eye-popping 1,500 feet per minute. I want a landing that doesn't require emergency services, so let's rethink that final segment. A continuous descent from INSAGE to cross the threshold at 50 feet must lose 2,719 feet over 7 miles, or 388 feet per nautical mile. That's much steeper than standard. In fact, any approach greater than 400 feet per nautical mile is ineligible for straight-in minimums. Yet this steep angle is what the Garmin Plus V guidance will do. If we follow that path all the way back to Fetage, the glide path will reach 5,016 feet. We'd be right on it at 5,000, but 500 feet above it at 5,500. That's why option four requires some sort of course reversal. This is also why walking through what to expect rather than blindly following plus V guidance is important. You don't want the steep descent to be a surprise. What if there weren't plus V guidance? The approach chart doesn't include a visual descent point, but we can create our own. A quick down and dirty rule is to divide altitude to lose by 300. That's 760 minus 31 divided by 300, or 2.4 miles from the point we must descend from MDA in order to reach the runway touchdown zone. Figure that the threshold, which the GPS is counting down to, is about 0.2 miles before the touchdown zone. So if our GPS shows 2.2 miles remaining to the threshold and we fail to see the runway environment, the required descent rate will only grow with our custom VDP now in the rearview mirror. At this point, we'd execute the missed approach procedure and our plan B. Arriving at MDA by our makeshift VDP means we should descend at least 760 feet per minute, about the same rate we'd use on the intermediate segment. So whether we follow plus V guidance or use our own plan, we should plan for that aggressive rate of descent from Fetage all the way to MDA at a point 2.2 miles prior to the threshold, well before QQO. Luckily, we have good visibility below the clouds, so we can comfortably reconfigure for landing with the three-degree PAPI. That's important because the lack of a published VDP and absence of a gray triangle pointing toward the touchdown zone in the profile view are a heads up that obstacles might complicate a continuous descent to the runway. This is confirmed by the note, visual segment, obstacles, so it's imperative that we have sufficient visibility to avoid them as we land. Any of the options require bringing our A game to this approach. Even a perfectly executed approach arrives at an MDA merely 71 feet below the reported cloud base. It's important to anticipate the steeper descent before we fly it. That's what turns an uneventful flight into an uneventful landing at Tillamook. Now listen to the roundtable, where Catherine is joined by Tom Turner, Bruce Williams, Doug Stewart, John Krug, and Mark Kolber. Then head to the hangar and join the conversation. Okay, we don't have time to listen to the instructor's roundtable here, but you can get access to this entire discussion. At the end of the video, you can sign up for a free 30-day IFR Mastery membership and you'll have access to this complete scenario and 150 more like it, along with the instructor roundtable discussions, pilot forums, live polls, bonus quizzes, and other helpful resources. So that's it. Thanks for joining me today and safe flying.